Okay. Welcome to Old Guard of Summit, and good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure this morning to introduce Frank Bolden. <clears throat> Frank has had many titles during his nearly 50 year career in the military, Wall Street, and corporate America. The title he relishes most is Papa from his two year old great grandson, Mason. He began his career as an airborne ranger, infantry officer in the army with tours in Germany, the United States, and South Vietnam. He next worked as an associate of Cahill Gordon in New York City. The last 30 years of his career were spent with Johnson & Johnson, where he was an associate general counsel responsible for providing legal support for the company's business in Africa, the Middle East and parts of Europe, human resources, labor relations, and ERISA. He also served as secretary of the company and vice president of diversity worldwide. Frank has served many community organizations in the fields of healthcare, education, and the arts. He was last chair of the Overlook Hospital Board and served on the charter board of Atlantic Health System. He chaired the boards of Union County College and the University of Vermont, as well as Crossroads Theater. Additionally, Frank served on the boards of the New York State Opera and the State Theater. Frank is the immediate past chair of the United Church of Christ, where he authored a resolution to dismantle the new Jim Crow. He is also credited with initiating the Dialogues on Race and the White Privilege programs in Summit. <clears throat> Frank earned a bachelor's degree from the University of Vermont, an MBA and law degree from Columbia University, and an honorary doctorate, doctorate's degree from his alma mater. He has been honored with many awards for his leadership and service. Frank and his wife Penny have been married 57 years and have been blessed with four children, nine grandchildren, and one great grandchild. They have lived in Berkeley Heights for 47 years and attend the Christ Church where Frank has, been chair, has chaired the executive board, serves on the race equity task force, and sings in the choir. He is also a member of the Old Guard. So now I will turn the meeting over to Frank for a talk that I'm sure we will all find very interesting. Frank, it's all yours. Thank you, Don, <clears throat> and good morning, everybody. About six weeks ago, I sat in my office ready to scream as loud as I could from the pain, the anguish, frustration, despair, and fear caused by the brutal, senseless killing of another unarmed African-American by the police. I will never forget the night my sons, my brother, and I were returning home from a Nick game. Just as we pulled up in front of his home, a police car with flashing red lights parked behind us. In the rear view mirror, I could see the officers with guns drawn approach our car from both sides. I told my sons who were sitting in the back seat to place their hands on the top of the seat in front of them and not to move or say anything. Just as one officer reached my door, his partner got a call on his radio. They both hoisted their guns, returned to their car, and left without a word being spoken. I said a prayer of thanks and told my boys that you had to be very careful in situations like that. That's not the only dicey encounter I have had with the police. There have been many others in Georgia, in New York, in New Jersey, all of them a mere finger snap away from being a bad front page headline. Other stops by policemen have been fine, helpful, even respectful. 
business as it should be. But the ones that stick in your craw are the spine tingling experiences that trigger every nerve in your body. I can't begin to describe to you the fear parents of African-American children feel each time their child walks out the door. My son is 55 years old. And each time he visits me, I still ask him to call me when he gets home late at night. So I know he's safe. In the midst of the pandemic that shut down the nation, killing people of color at a disproportionate rate, on top of a dire economic crisis that surely tests the ability of many to feed, house, and keep their loved ones safe, especially the poor, and once again, disproportionately African Americans, the precious life of another black person was needlessly snuffed out. Adding to the long list of martyrs like Sandra Bland, Freddie Gray, Tamir Rice, Philando Castile, and on and on and on, who have been killed by those charged with protecting them. I wanted to scream, but the cry never came, because that would be a futile act. And at this age, I tried to limit my energy to things that can make a difference. Participating in the protests, protests and vigils commemorating the lives of George Floyd, Amu Arbery, and Breonna Taylor, and reemphasizing that Black lives, lives Matter was a tempting option, which I ultimately ruled out because as a large old Black man with a host of preconditions, I was too easy a target for the COVID-19 virus. As I watched the protests mature, gain momentum, and spread, a role for me became evident. I have witnessed protests most of my life, starting with the demonstrations after the murder of Emmett Till, the Montgomery bus boycott, the sit-ins and freedom rides, the I Have a Dream meeting, the riots in Newark, Detroit, and LA in 1967. The latter had an, an enormous impact on my life because at that time, I was a psychological warfare officer in the army serving in Vietnam. As such, I was spending a lot of American dollars trying to improve the lives of the Vietnamese while my people were catching hell in our country. I resigned my commission and came home to try to improve the lives of blacks here. Blessed with the first amendment, American history is ripe with protests. You name the cause, and a quick Google search can list the demonstrations that have been held to further the goal of that initiative. Women's rights, abortions, single-sex marriage, gun control, and on and on and on. They all pop up from time to time. But the constant topic for protests is the elimination of all facets of racism. The protests after the brutal beating of Rodney King in 1991, the death of Trayvon Martin in 2012 and Eric Garner in 2014, led to a cry against the killing of unarmed black victims by members of law enforcement. The current protests are similar to those, but quite different in many significant ways. And aha! there was my course of action. To explain those differences to people of influence with whom I had contact. And what better group to start with than the old guard with whom I had discussed dismantling the new Jim Crow back in 2014. During that session, we covered how the war on drugs led to mass incarceration and in which an inordinate number of African Americans have been imprisoned and forced into a caste of second-class citizenship with no right to vote, no protection against discrimination in employment, housing, education, health care, and so on. And to that incendiary mix was added the ever-increasing gap between the races in earnings, education, 
employment, health, justice, and this is remarkable, the prediction that one in every young black male during their lives would fall under the clutches of the criminal justice system. At that session, we asked the question, of what happens when the tipping point is reached? And recited the words from Langston Hughes that said, what happens to a dream deferred? Does it crust over like a syrupy sweet or does it explode? To try to avoid the realization of that point, the Black Lives Matter movement arose in 2013 to find peaceful solutions to the unbearable pressure that was building up in the Black community. That effort was countered by the All Lives Matter that failed to understand that all lives could not matter if Black lives did not. Additionally, the killing of unarmed Blacks by police with impunity continues, continues around the country at a pace of almost one a month. Then along came the pandemic, and as no surprise, killed a disordinate number of African Americans primarily because of the gap in health care. On top of that was at the close of the economy. This imposed a double whammy because unemployment for blacks was higher than unemployment for whites. And on the other hand, a lot of African Americans are essential workers who had to work outside their homes during the shutdown, risking their lives and those of their families to the virus. The confluence of all these stress factors have produced protests that are different from all previous attempts to voice the necessity for eliminating racism from the American experiment. Let's take a look at some of these differences. One, the pressure of racism, the pandemic, and the economic crisis provided the crucible for the explosion of outrage that resulted from the virile dissemination of the video of the killing of George Floyd. People were cooped up in close quarters during a period of great uncertainty with poor leadership and poor prospects for good news in the immediate future. The vigils and protests that resulted were an effective vow for pent up fears and expressions of hope for better times. Number two, a lot of the current protests are led by younger Americans who are not bound by the limitations of the past. They are energetic, creative, and filled with spirit. They think for themselves, ask why and why not a lot, and will not be deterred by the niceties of current conventions. They mean business and everything is on the table. The third difference, the goals from these protests are different from the others. The goals are now transformative instead of incremental, moving beyond merely modifying behavior to actually changing systems. So instead of modifying the behavior of police, they question the necessity of police at all. Instead of seeking the modest logical changes that to date have been so difficult to achieve, their approach is to scrap the archaic, difficult to manage system and replace it with something that better serves our needs today. Um, Several years ago, after I gave a presentation on dismantling um, the new Jim Crow down in Virginia, a young black woman in the audience stood up during the question and answer period and said, with all due respect, Mr. Bolden, what you're recommending are, are, are nice changes, but they're not enough. We need to do something bold. We need to change the system. I don't want to go out and put a Band-Aid on this problem. I want to eliminate this problem. And you know, she was right. And today, 
the platform is theirs. The protesters are no longer just blacks and a few white supporters. They are now black, white, brown, yellow, and red. Democrats, independents, and Republicans. Old, middle-aged, and young. Parents taking their children to stand up against oppression. Young adults taking their parents to single solidarity in the fight to stop unjustifiable injustice. Jews, Christians, Catholics, Protestants, Muslims, atheists, all standing shoulder to shoulder to, man, to demand a stop to the madness. Number five, technology is a huge game changer. Cell phones permit people to see and hear encounters with their own eyes and ears. Live first impressions count. The initial public account of an incident is no longer the version doctored to show the offending officer in the best possible light. Instead of reading that the victim was resisting arrest, we now see and hear an unfiltered recording showing that the poor man was on the ground crying, I can't breathe, while being subdued by three officers, one of whom had his knee on his neck saying, shut up and stop using so much air. Instead of reading that the officer was fearing for his life, we see that the man was running away from the officer when he was shot six times in the back. Technology is a big changer. It's also a big changer in other ways. Computers and cell phones enable the history of past atrocities to be reviewed in no time at all. At the flick of a finger, news can be spread, crowds can be assembled, vigil and movements can be initiated faster than cleanups can be created or deflections developed to cover up horrendous incidents of inhumane brutality. Technology is a big game changer. Number six, the protests are no longer occurring just in Newark, Detroit, and LA, but they're occurring also in Summit, in Berkeley Heights, Scotch Plains, Madison, and thousands of other suburban towns across the country. Number seven, these protests against racism are no longer confined to the United States, but are being held in Europe, in Asia, in Africa, all around the globe. All over the world, people are saying, stop this. They look to the United States to be the beacon of hope, freedom, and justice. The world needs us to be at our best. Today, number eight, Today, there are at least three Black Lives Matter banners hanging in Summit. A recent poll indicates that 60% of Americans and a majority of white people now believe that Black lives do matter and realize that's a requirement to ensure that all lives matter. We cannot have one without the other. And right now, Black lives are the ones being stuffed out in disproportionate numbers and alarming frequency. More than 15 so far this year. That has to stop. And you and I have to do our part to stop it. Why? Because it's the right thing to do. You know, this pandemic has been an unimaginable tragedy for millions of people. To date, over 140,000 deaths in the United States. That's a number that you just can't get your hand around. 140,000 people have been killed by this pandemic. Just unimaginable. But for me, the pandemic has been a mere inconvenience. Yeah, I have been shut up since, shut in since March. No visits to the barber shop, as you can see no restaurants, no in-person meetings, no movies, no March Madness, no NBA or Yankees. 
been a mere inconvenience. And on the other hand, I have spent plenty of quality time with my family. I have not had to go out there where the virus is lurking, looking for victims. Someone has delivered our groceries to our door every week. I sit on the deck and play with my great grandson. I eat vegetables from my wife's garden, a mere inconvenience. Not like the poor souls who don't have the money to pay for the next meal or the rent or who don't know if there will be a job to go back to or the poor souls who have to take public transportation into the middle of the virus to earn a living for their family or for those who have lost loved ones through this crisis or for those who have been victims of the virus. The stress, pain, and anguish must be excruciating, unbearable. That's the pandemic, a mere inconvenience for some, unimaginable suffering for others. That's the way it is with racism. For those, mainly whites, who have the power, money, and shield to be protected from the oppressive sting of that curse, racism is a mere inconvenience or even a non-entity. But to those, mainly African Americans and people of color, who bear the brunt of this debilitating, dehumanizing scourge, including police brutality, racism is no joke. It is a cancer that must be excised from the American body and your help is required to get the job done. It is the right thing to do and now is the time. A quick aside on pr police brutality. The killing of unarmed blacks, as horrendous as they are, are only the tip of the iceberg. The black eyes, broken nose, bruised faces, cracked ribs, and other assorted injuries while in police custody are so numerous and accepted that they are not even ever mentioned or reported. But the lingering effect of those daily atrocities are never forgotten by the victims or their loved ones. When I told my friends about this opportunity to speak to you today, one of my fr white friends asked, why? He said, the old guard is a bunch of old white men who are comfortable with their lives and are not about to make any changes. I think he is partially wrong. You are comfortable and proud of your accomplishment, but rightfully so, you worked hard for them. I also think that if you saw an unarmed man being held on the ground by three policemen screaming that he could not breathe, you would say, stop. Don't do that. This I believe, or I would not be a member of the group. The time for action is now. The question is what and how? There are many roles that you can play to help our country live into its great promise. Let's review a few that I thought of. Number one, you can do nothing just to continue to live your comfortable lives and leave things as they are. That would prove my friend's caution to be true. But I am sure for most of you, that is not an option. Choosing this path will, will not stop the pendulum from swinging in the direction of racial justice. The United States is at its best when the creativity and energy of all its people are free to pursue the great potential of the country. Racism makes no sense and is a tremendous hindrance to the realization of that goal. The power of the current protests tends to indicate that the nation is on a path to finally deal effectively with racism. I'm sure that most of you are decent, fair-minded people who have worked hard to achieve your status and do not begrudge the right and ability of others to do the same. Racism and the obstacle it forces, fosters to keep Ameri African Americans from pursuing the American dream are real. 
you members of the old guard are people of influence who have the power to help eliminate this problem. It is a much more exciting option than doing nothing. The same technology that enables today's pro protesters to swiftly find facts, fighters, and forums is available for the education of anyone who desires to know more or anything about racism, police brutality, the pandemic, and anything else. There are articles, videos, movies, books, statistics readily available for anyone who wishes to be greater informed about this matter. The Summit Interfaith Council conducts regular dialogues on race to assist those who would like to improve their knowledge of the subject. I don't know that any of you are anxious to grab a placard and join an active protest, but that's okay because there are more effective ways for you to make a difference in the massive change that is and must occur in our country so that our children can live in a better place than we have. You can talk to your friends about racism and the plight of people of color in the United States. That should help you determine what other steps you might want to take. Whenever this shutdown is over and we are able to have family holiday dinners again, Settings where gratitude for your blessings are expressed and prayers for the less fortunate are invoked. You might encourage, commit, enable, or even lead discussions about this subject without condemning the views of family members who advocate for change for the present system. These are the few suggestions that crossed my mind while putting this talk together. I am sure you will think of plenty others because that's what you do. That's what you have done all your lives. And I'm sure you will find creative, innovative ways to help eliminate racism. Last week, I told a friend of mine that I had to end our telephone conversation because I wanted to work on this presentation. He said, why are you doing this? You're retired. You need to learn how to relax. Let me close by showing you why I do this. Paul? Paul? Unmute, it's coming, just a second. This is technology at work. Are uh, you seeing that? Okay. This is why I do this. These are my grandsons, Kendall and Kyle Bolden. And Paul, will you show the next one, please? And this is my great grandson, Mason Frank Bolden. This is why this talk is important to me, especially your role. I want for them what you want for your grands a fair shot at the American dream. I don't want them to be the one of three black men that will come under the auspices of the criminal justice system through their lives. And I certainly don't want them or any other child to become the headline for another police brutality. The madness must stop and you must help us do it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, thank you so much, Frank. Uh, other, other people will say some things in a moment. Uh, I think uh, Don, here, I just okay. unmuted you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much, Frank, for a very inspiring talk. I'm sure uh, it's going to be very interesting to a lot of other people since uh, we ought to be able to disseminate the uh, recording of it. Uh, I believe now uh, Frank is willing to accept questions. Uh, I've been asked to remind you that uh, please ask questions. Uh, don't make uh, speeches or presentations so that we have plenty of time 
for everyone to ask. So uh, I think at this time, uh, <clears throat> people will be raising their blue hand. And I guess, Paul, you'll call on the people in order uh, to uh, ask their question. Yes, I will. Um, you have to uh, click on your participants icon at the bottom or the top of your screen so that the participants list appears. And uh, then at the bottom of the participants list, you should see some colored icons, one of which is a blue hand. And you have to click that. And then a blue hand appears alongside your name. And then we'll know you want to ask a question. That is our procedure. And I would also say that we have a lot of guests, and guests are welcome to participate in this uh, in this discussion as well. So, with that, um, now I'll, I'll unmute you as we go. Uh, Art Patchett, you're at the top of the list. Min 1090. I recognize your screen name. You have to unmute yourself, Art. All right, while you're figuring that out, we'll go to the next one. Um, and that's, oh, sir, Haas Srikanten, there. Haas? We don't, we don't hear you, Haas, but you don't look like you're muted. He's, he's unmuted. All right, we'll leave. Oh, you've got microphone issues. All right. So that means we, <laughs> it's on to Nolan. Okay. Uh, great talk. Thank you very much. I was here years ago when you gave a talk before. One more fact statistic I would add to all your great analysis of the uh, protests and the demonstrations. One thing that hit me over the head like a baseball bat, I'm an actuary and I deal with numbers, and it hit me like 80% of all the millions of protesters, 80% were white. 80% were white. Cornell West and all the leading intellectuals say this is going to be different because now it's a majority white nation and 80% of the protesters were white. 60% of the public is in favor of Black Lives Matter. Please expound. I'm trying to be an optimist here. <laughs> um, I think uh, the numbers speak to themselves. Uh, in previous protests, it was primarily African-Americans and their allies, their white friends who were out there marching. Mm -hmm. Today, mm -hmm. that's changed tremendously. And uh, not only are, are, are whites leading, but young whites are leading. The young people are stepping up because they're not willing to continue to go through the dance that we've been dancing for 400 years. They want change. Uh, and I think the fact that 80% uh, of the protests are white, as you say, uh, and the fact that a number of them are young people, I think this means that we have a wonderful opportunity here to really make some serious change. The question is, as I speak to the old guard, is what role are we willing to play to help our country move forward? Okay, thank you. Um, Alan Hamilton. Thanks for unmuting me. Uh, Frank, thanks a lot for your presentation. I appreciate your words, both the problems and the potential solution. But my observation is that none of this is going to change unless um, African Americans and people of color register to vote and vote for politicians and people who agree with their values. So in spite of the enthusiasm this time around, uh, I think it'll fade unless uh, we, get, uh, we get people to register and vote and pay attention to what's going on. What's your take on that? I agree with you that it is very important that we get everybody 
to register and to vote. Um, but I, I think the, the solution right now in this country uh, rests in the hands of whites who have the power, who have the money, uh, who control everything. Uh, African Americans have to do their part, of course, and voting is a very important part of it. I agree with you. But if whites wanted to change the system, they could right now. And I think the young whites who are participating in the protest in, in the great numbers, like we haven't seen before, are saying, yes, let's get that job done. Um, and so um, I, I'm hopeful that this time around, because of all of the conditions, we have an opportunity to move forward. And I, I, I agree that voting is a very, very big part of it. And voting by African-Americans is an essential part of it. Okay, thank you. Um, Ken Lindhorst, you're up next. Thank you. Hey, Frank, I thought your presentation was absolutely excellent. There wasn't a thing in it that I didn't agree with. And the thing that I guess I relate to the most is that technology is a real game changer. Most of those who support change towards non-discrimination, however, also support law and order. And what scares me is the videos of those almost always black who are breaking in, stealing, and then burning businesses. And my first reaction is, oh no, this is exactly what the racists want want to see. I think what the movement needs are black people who will stand up and argue that law and order must be preserved. We saw some of that, some people trying to stop the looters, but in fact, uh, for whatever reason and because it plays on TV, you see as much of that as you do of the abuse. So let me just add that, that I think they need to, the, the, the movement needs to establish the fact that it's basically law and order and uh, nonviolent. The other thing is I, I want to add on to, to Alan Hamilton's comment about politics. I think there's a lot of support for Black Lives Matter and stopping police abuse, but real change needs to be political. Um, not only do the blacks need to vote, and they are, and we are getting more black uh, elected officials, uh, particularly at the lower levels. When you look at uh, comments on what's happening in the pandemic, a lot of the mayors are already black. Uh, but I think political change needs to be involved in really making the most fundamental changes in non-discriminatory treatment, and I'll leave it there. But thank you for what you've done. I appreciate everything you said, and uh, hopefully we in Old Guard can help make a difference. Thank you. I, I, I agree with you that it's important um, for law and order to be part of the equation. Um, but I'll point out that uh, the looting and the violence have been very small portions of these protests but a great portion of the coverage of the protests. Uh, that uh, is in the hands of the media uh, and they do what they do because they're trying to get ratings. Um, and I don't know what the answer is to that. I do know that um, in the past uh, where nonviolence was the motto of the uh, protesters back in the 60s, that's more difficult to uh, sustain today because um, with technology again, uh, there's no, there very little planning for these protests. They're almost spontaneous now. And uh, there's very little time to train uh, the active participants uh, in the, in the, in the uh, background of nonviolence. Uh, and there's no control over people who just come in as, as an opportunity to do what they do. Uh, and uh, um, so I agree with you that law and order is important. And, and I think people who are leading the protests understand that. I just hope that the media uh, appreciates it also. 
Thank you, Frank. Um, before we go into the next question, let me remind you that we're very pleased to have visitors, a lot of visitors today, and you are very welcome to participate in this uh, discussion and ask questions. So just uh, do the blue hand thing if you have figured that out. So next is Herb Waddell. Um, hi, Frank. Great talk. Good to see you again. Haven't seen you at meetings for a couple of years now. Uh, I have found that there's some very knowledgeable uh, columnists, black columnists. For example, uh, Jason O'Reilly comes to mind. Uh, but there are several that contribute to the Wall Street Journal. And others that I see, I watch a lot of Fox News and other channels as well. But um, these are reasoning, reasoning people like yourself who feel that there's a wider problem, namely uh, they want to include black on black crime in the discussion and work on the overall problem of improving the life of blacks overall. Uh, could you comment on that, please? Yeah, I, I think that that's a distraction. Uh, when we say we're protesting the taking of black lives by police, taking the uh, lives of unarmed black victims, uh, people then come back and say, yeah, but there's black on black crime. That's an issue. Black on black crime is an issue. But the prime issue that we have to deal with is racism. Uh, black on black crime is something that must be addressed, uh, as is white on white crime, something that must be addressed. Uh, and I think that black on black crime surfaces every time protesters are trying to get people to stop atrocities that are being committed by police against unarmed blacks. Um, so I think that both things need to be addressed. Um, I don't think you'll get any argument that uh, police abuse has to be stopped. It, it not only affects black lives, it affects white lives. It's a, that, that is a problem that is general. Uh, and I, I'm happy to address it. I think it's a, a serious problem. But uh, it's, it's just a narrow part of the overall black-white conflict that, that police of all colors do kill innocent people of all colors. And it seems like the current situation is opening things up for the fascists, the communists, the socialists who want to destroy our country. So there are a lot of good intentioned people who are in a quandary because by supporting Black Lives Matter, they're en encouraging chaos, which leads ultimately to the end of our system. Can you comment on that? Yeah, I will. Uh, supporting Black Lives Matter does not encourage chaos. The Black Lives Matter movement is a peaceful movement. The Black Lives Matter movement uh, was designed to show people and tell people what's going on uh, as far as the killing of unarmed Blacks. That's what it was about. It has nothing to do with violence. And I think that's why 60% of white people now support it because they have learned that it has nothing to do with violence. It has nothing to do with fascism. It has nothing to do with communism. It has to do with trying to stop unarmed blacks from being killed. That's what it's all about. Well, as I said, I'm happy to support better control of police. I just don't approve of all of the methods of bringing that message into focus. But, hey, you, you gave a great talk. 
I really appreciated it. Thank you, Herb. Thank you, Herb. Okay. Um, so, Dick Aiken? Ah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Frank, for a wonderful talk. Uh, I'm following up uh, comments by Alan Hamilton and Ken Lindhorst saying that really uh, the black community needs uh, to be able to register and to uh, vote. And I think the, I asked the question, uh, this is topic number one of questions, uh, what can we do so that we can help uh, the, our black communities get their members registered there, they certainly are, are ways of doing it uh, electronically, getting the right forms in, in the hands of people so they can register, and also to vote by mail. And 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 uh, I was wondering if you could comment on things that we could do. Should we work with the League of Women Voters? What should we do about getting Black uh, voters uh, actually voting by mail this general election? That's topic number one. Okay, it is topic number one, and let's talk about it. Uh, one thing you can do is to support the legislation to eliminate uh, voter suppression, which is going on around the country big time, actively. Um, it's not just getting blacks out to vote. It's trying to uh, make sure that blacks have the right to vote. What is going on in our country right now in state after state <clears throat> is legislation trying to eliminate any gains that were made under the uh, Right to Vote Act uh, by uh, eliminating Blacks from the voters' rolls. Uh, this talk we had uh, several years ago about uh, uh, dismantling the new, new Jim Crow, one of the reasons for that was that a, a tremendous a number of Blacks were not permitted to vote because they had uh, criminal records, some criminal records from just minor offenses. A lot of states since our talk have changed that, but even in states that um, uh, address that change, there are now measures trying to keep Blacks from voting. Uh, and, and what we need to do is work with any organization, organization, all the organizations who are active in trying to um, make sure that voter suppression uh, is not the law of the land in, in, in the United States right now. That's the big issue. Thank you very much, Frank. The other thing is, uh, I was wondering if you could comment uh, on uh, what I believe is called in the House of Representatives, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. And I believe it has a broad uh, uh, ca capabilities uh, uh, to, to restrict uh, the, the, the police actions, especially uh, the doctrine of qualified immunity uh, by which uh, a policeman can basically do anything and be assured that he, will, he, will not, uh, he, or her, he or she would not be prosecuted. Could you comment on uh, you know, what we could do to support uh, such uh, such work, uh, uh, if it's in the House, what could we do to, to get our senators to actually <laughs> twist Mitch McConnell's arms <laughs> even stronger? What can we do? I think what we do in the Senate is what you mentioned before. We just got to vote people in the office who will do the right thing and vote people out of office who won't do the right thing. On the, um, the, the, the legislation that you mentioned, uh, it is something that's needed. Uh, but it is something that needs to be worked out. You know, with laws, uh, you try to get the, uh, the right formula uh, as, as you pass a law, but sometimes you don't get it right, so then you have to make adjustments. The important thing that we must do now is we must move forward uh, with the momentum that's been gained from these protests. And I think what we all can do is to write our legislators and let them know how we feel. Let them know that you support this action or that action. I mean, uh, they, 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 they rely on that type of correspondence. And, and I think that's the most effective thing that you can do now. The other thing that you can do is you can provide money to support um, 
those candidates around the country uh, who feel the way you feel uh, and are willing to take the type actions that you mentioned. Thank you, Fred. Yeah. Larry Cunningham, you have to unmute. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, thanks, Frank. Uh, it's, uh, it certainly gives us some food for thought in terms of our, uh, each of us are usually in a nice little comfortable little shell and sometimes we need to get out of that shell. But this one thing I've, I've been struggling with for a long time and that is that prior to the pandemic, myself and a few other folks from our church used to work down at a soup kitchen every few weeks at the border of Irvington and Newark. And the people that utilize that uh, soup kitchen are probably about 80% black, maybe 10, 15% Hispanic, and maybe 5% white. And the one thing that really surprised me is the first time I went there, I uh, found out that the person who ran it, he's a, uh, works at one of the um, uh, diocese uh, offices down there. The first thing he would do before people were allowed to actually get their meal was to listen to the amount of of opportunities that were available. Now, these opportunities were resources in terms of uh, education, in terms of uh, childcare, in terms of transportation, in terms of getting a job, uh, training, academics. Quite amazing that there's actually a significant amount of resources out there if a person is willing and has the motivation to use it, grab it. And so, you know, I would listen to that and then, you know, we would go about our business of serving the food and stuff. And it always wonders me is, you know, how do you, how do you change that? There's something missing in that neighborhood. You know, the inner, the, the area that we serve down there at Irvington and, and Newark, there's, there's something missing that, that keeps people, keeps the environment and the neighborhood the way it is, which is not, you know, obviously not very physically attractive. Uh, can you comment on that? I mean, I don't know if it's motivation. I don't know if it's lack of a, no, uh, you know, um, right. a mentor or something like that. So, right. it's one thing to make a bunch of uh, initiatives or services available for people who need them. It's another thing for the people who need them to actually get to uh, take advantage of those opportunities. Yeah. A lot of time you'll have programs that are available, but the red tape, the bureaucracy um, uh, that one has to overcome in order to take advantage of those opportunities. When is the yeah, it's discouraging sometimes probably. Uh, you know, you can have a service that's available, but if you don't have um, childcare that's available so that the person can get to where the service is, doesn't work. I mean, there are a lot of different reasons. So yeah. just listing, listing, L-I-S-T-I-N-G, listing um, opportunities, and then saying people aren't taking advantage of them. There's a big gap between them. And, and those, those neighborhoods are the way they are, Larry, because the results of racism. For in the first place, uh, a lot of people are there because they couldn't be anyplace else. Yeah. A lot of people are there because they're coming out of prison and can't afford to go anywhere else. A lot of people are there because uh, they, they can't get a job. They can't get a job. For no, it's tough. It's tough. It's, 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 it's complicated, but that's what we have to change. That is what racism is all about. And, and it's hard to understand it just looking at it from yeah. the outside or yeah. going in, helping like you do, and, and seeing some of the dynamics. Uh, it's, it's, it's a rotten system, and, and, and it's very difficult for people to climb out of that place. And a lot of people do, a lot of people try, but it's difficult. That's what we need to change. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Larry. Gene okay. Shan. Yes, thanks very much, Frank. Uh, and to extend what Dick Aiken was asking you, I'm, I work mainly in the Montclair area, and I'm already involved with four groups working for racial and criminal justice. But I think the idea that we all can unite in this effort makes me wonder if you could perhaps submit a, a list of groups. You mentioned the Summit Interfaith Group. If you could supply our group with a, a list of the organizations with whom we might coordinate. I think there are a lot of us out there who, who feel like we want to, to make some effort 
but if we can coordinate it all, I think there's a lot of power that, that could be brought to bear. So if you could do that for us, that would be wonderful. And thanks for that courageous talk. Thanks and done. We'll get to the list. Great. Okay. Um, Walt Meissner. Uh, hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, Mike. Yeah. Okay. That, that was a very elegant and well-spoken talk that you gave. It was really, really well done. Um, you know, over the years since the 70s, you know, I've, I've noticed, um, you know, just from the outside looking in, you know, sort of the subtle pervasiveness of racism at all levels. You know, for instance, uh, there was a friend co-worker that worked in New Jersey and he relocated and got a job down in Georgia. And I talked to him and I asked him, well, how, how is it down there? Well, turns out he's Armenian and because his skin isn't lily white, it's a little, little bit swarthy. He says, well, they're not quite accepting me as much as they do up in New Jersey. You know, and also I, I sort of get the feeling, that, you know, going from the deep south to the far north that, you know, racism is high in the south and it becomes less and less as you, you know, get further north. Because I did meet a, um, a black businessman from Rochester and he seemed like a regular guy, you know, nothing bothered him. He was very confident and all that kind of stuff. But the one thing I want to mention or ask about is, is um, for a very brief time, I lived in a adjacent to an area which was a Chicano area, which is Mexican American, basically. And the people there, if they're in high school, by the time they become of adolescent age, they're pretty much forced to be in a gang. And then when they, um, and 50% of them actually die before age 18. And they have absolutely no prospect for any kind of decent job. Maybe the best they can get is a factory job. And, and, uh, uh, and you know, so on one side of the city, there were the, you know, Chicano gangs. And on the other side of the city were the black gangs and the Crips and the Bloods. And in general, they never, they rarely interacted, but between each other, there'd be, you know, I mean, it was quite tough growing up in those neighborhoods. And um, if, I, if I think about a city like Newark, um, I think, um, you know, somewhere they said 400 people die every year in Newark and um, nobody ever complains about it, never hears about it in the news. And, and from what, also from what I have read, there are a lot of, um, you know, fatherless families where there's no guidance. And so it's like a real cycle of poverty, you know, and so this obviously racism lies on top of the problem as well. But is there, I think the image would be better if this cycle could be broken and get people out of that, out of that rut. Do you have any comments on that? No, breaking the cycle is exactly what we need to do. But let me tell you, Walt, that racism is alive uh, and active here in New Jersey, just like it is in Georgia and South Carolina. Uh, and, and those Hispanic gangs and black gangs that you described, those are horrendous situations. What we have to do is to pay attention to the things that we can change. There's very little way that uh, you or I from here uh, can do much to affect the dynamics of those gangs in, in, in New York and other cities. But what we can do is we can start the dialogue, we can start the discussion on race and racism in our own communities, in our own lives, in our own families, uh, and, and start the discussion about what it is and how we can change it. And from those discussions, uh, the actions uh, that we take uh, can radiate out and affect um, the entire country. Um, racism is a very, very complex uh, matter. Uh, it exists in every aspect of, of our lives. Uh, it's, it's so well ingrained that we probably aren't really aware of it, uh, but it's there. And it's there perpetuating situations like the one you described. And what we have to do 
is to become aware and educated about that and start taking the measures to change that. Because if we don't, uh, then uh, chaos will, ex will, will uh, uh, exist. Thanks a lot, Walt. At this point, um, I'd like to call on one of our guests. Um, Julie Keenan uh, has two blue raised hands clapping. I think that might mean a raised hand to ask. But Ju Julie is, by the way, currently the chairman of the board of the Summit Foundation, formerly the Summit Public Area Foundation, which our own Jack Cooper ran so marvelously well for so many years. And Julie is running it now. So Julie, would you care to say a few words? I think she's unmuted. Well, I don't hear her. So, Julie, if you're there and uh, I still want to talk, just uh, uh, say something. But next, it's um, Bill Tittle. Paul, well, um, Frank, uh, great honor to hear you talk. Uh, I'm the director of the Old Guard. And um, I want your advice about something, but I first want to say uh, something uh, positive about the outlook. I think that another factor is that um, there's a growing income inequality in this country. And people that fall into that category, I think, naturally are attracted to Black Lives Matter movement. And secondly, I think um, uh, I, I lived um, in Westfield all my life. Um, and um, the white majority uh, is, is ending. Yellow people, brown people, black people, okay, uh, Latinos, that's, that's happening. It's just going to happen. And so the white majority has to face facts and make this into a pluralistic society. Now for my question. Um, I agree with you that um, the old guard members, if they ran into that policeman in Minneapolis, they would have saved George. But we are a bunch of uh, mainly old white men and um, I'm looking for diversity. And the idea that I would, I don't have any black friends to tell you the truth. I just don't run into them. Um, um, trying to br bring a black member into this organization, I wouldn't do it. Uh, a one guy, a token guy. So I'm looking for a marriage. I'm looking for what I might call a black caucus of the uh, United States uh, Congress. I'm looking for an organization of black men who want to uh, change, probably no. Detroit. Yeah. Your voice went away. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes. I'm looking for an organization of black men, probably retired, um, hopefully not a religious affiliation, because that's a, a, a tough issue in the old guard. Um, that can, um, in, in, meet with us, encounter with, I mean, those of us that are interested in doing this. So we can have a serious dialogue and jointly come up with some things to do. What do you think? I, I think that would be wonderful if we can find them. Uh, and, 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 you know, uh, they would have to want to participate. Uh, and I think it's something worth uh, pursuing. Um, you, you, you also mentioned the, the demographics, uh, and that's a subject uh, I think uh, worthy of an old guard uh, presentation uh, to look at how uh, populations in the United States are changing uh, racially, ethnically. Um, and I, I think that would be a fascinating talk uh, for the old guard uh, to see how those uh, numbers are, are shaping up and to discuss what the implications are for everybody uh, from, from that dynamic. Um, as far as uh, you said, you're looking for a group of black guys, but then you delivered, I mean, you, you specifically said that uh, not religious. Uh, I think you're gonna have a hard time finding black men who are not religious, who wanna participate in something like this. I think you have to take 
you have to take the blinders off. You have to take the limitations off. If, if, if you're looking for black men to participate with, with you, then it's got to be black men and, and, and whatever and whoever they are uh, so that, uh, you know, you, you, you get the true representation. But it's right, um, working with Bill, and I'll, I'll, I'll be willing to uh, uh, work with you on that. Thanks, Frank. As a member. Thanks. I'll help with the communications, uh, the follow-up communications. So we had another uh, guest uh, who had her hand raised a little while ago. Anyway, let, let me ask you, Maggie Momber, would you like to say something? Maggie, by the way, runs a program in Summit, which provides, it's a mentorship program for uh, talented kids from the local inner cities who, who wouldn't otherwise have educational opportunities. So Maggie? So I don't hear, I unmuted her. Uh, maybe she's not on the call anymore. So um, Miguel. Aha. Uh -huh. Uh, okay, I'm unmuted. Thank you. Um, you saw me waving my hand. Uh, I just wanted to thank, thank you, uh, Frank, but I want to start off by uh, pointing out that uh, the uh, uh, hero who just passed away, John Lewis, uh, dedicated his whole life to getting uh, the right to vote and the ability to vote, almost giving his life during that campaign in the early 60s. So, I think black people really do want to vote. The question is not whether they want to. We can't blame the victim. They have to be able to. Now those marshes and the Black Lives Matter, Frank, my question has to do with how do we be do a better job of educating the public as to how the peaceful nonviolent movement works? Because there are people who say, demonstrators and, uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, destruction and law and order. I have to tell you, for all of you, uh, a demonstrator in the afternoon carrying a sign is not looting. On the other hand, a looter at 2 a.m. is not demonstrating. <laughs> somewhere, somewhere along the line, there's a difference and the opportunists come out at night like, you know, like the rats. And we, as, a, as an audience, have to be able to learn to tell the difference between the demonstrators and the looters. And the change, usually around 10 or 11 o'clock, when the police want to stop the demonstration, they go in with the clubs, everybody gets angry, they throw tear gas, we throw rocks, and boom, there it goes. And then everybody comes out and all hell breaks loose. So the demonstrators are not looting at 2 in the afternoon, and the looters are not demonstrating at two in the morning. So we need to be able to get that out. Also, like in the case of the fire uh, police station, there's a lot of times when uh, people from uh, against the movement take the opportunity to instigate and, and, and start you know, looting and demonstrations and firebombing and whatever to make the movement look bad. So how do we get the media to understand that we need to convey this? How do we get people to see it? And, and understand that, yes, we do want to vote, but uh, the, uh, the problem is the, the Voting Rights Act has been on McConnell's bill for 221 days, and he is not planning to move on it. So we have to be able to vote. In this year, we have to be able to vote without risking our lives uh, to vote, because in Wisconsin, a lot of people got sick because they stood in line to vote. So, that's the thing, and we could, we could do a whole chapter, a whole day on each one of the questions, you know, like the broken families. Yes, there are broken families because that's the way the laws are written. If there's a man in the house, you don't get any money. The, uh, the young people, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, ex, the people who have uh, records. When I was 14, I was playing stickball in, in Lower East Side, and a policeman stopped me and told me not to play stickball and gave me a lecture. A little bit after that, uh, one of the older guys pulled me aside and said, you know, it's their job to make sure that every kid has a criminal record, an arrest record before they get out of high school. I never played stickball again, okay? And I got out of a private Catholic school when I got to college. So there, there is a systemic effort, you know, to, and, and you wouldn't see that. And Nolan, you're not in your head. You know exactly what I'm talking about. 
but in any case, how do we do a better job to educate people that there is a difference between <laughs> the looters and the demonstrators, that the movement is a nonviolent, peaceful movement as exemplified by Martin King and John Lewis and all the other leaders, even Al Sharpton, you never saw him looting even though he's not one of our, our favorites, but <laughs> yeah, okay. And the other thing for Bill is, I would like if you could find a few black, brown, yellow, whatever members, because uh, you know Frank and I are probably pretty lonely when we meet with the uh, Brat Caucus and <laughs> in the old guard. I've had friends that I brought who were Jewish and they said, no, thank you, it's not for me. And, 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 and we're probably not even aware of that. Uh, that that that's the thing and as far as you know uh, moving to the south I've had some Italian Catholic friends move to Georgia and South Carolina they're in for quite a rude shock when they realize that they are you know a little suntan and they're Catholic oh my god so that's my question Frank and my lecture sorry <laughs> well I got the lecture I don't get the question <laughs> Miguel, uh, the questions you ask are questions that need to be answered, um, but they're questions that I, I don't have the answer for, are questions for the media, are questions for the audience, and we'll have to work together to come up with those answers. Um, thanks a lot. Okay, uh, Jim Shanley. You have to unmute. That do it? Yeah. Yes. Hi, Frank. Thanks for a great, great talk. Uh, I grew up in Brooklyn in the 40s and 50s. Where? Flatbush. I grew up in Williamsburg. We were in the year, the years of Jackie Robinson and Absolutely. Roy Campanella. Absolutely. Absolutely. John Newcomb. I never heard. I never heard my father say a bad word about a black man. And it reminds me of a song from South Pacific, which I think we all should listen to these days. And it's called, You've Got to Be Taught. And you've got to be taught racism. It's not something that you believe or just become uh, aware of. My, my parents stayed in the same neighborhood in Brooklyn until my father died. And in their last years, their next door neighbors were a group, group of a family of Haitians. And all they could do was take care of my parents. My brother, sister and I couldn't be there every day, but these people were there. They were, they were great people. And I just wish that we all had that opportunity to have parents who felt that way about racism. And I would wonder what you think. Jim, I agree. I, uh, racism is something that is taught uh, <laughs> from the cradle up uh, and in households with parents like yours, uh, they get the right lessons. Only if we could have more people and more lessons like that. Thanks, Jim. You're welcome. Thanks, Jim. Um, I, th I think Julie Keenan is back. So, Julie, I'm here. Can folks hear me? Yes. Oh, good. And so, I I just um I actually wasn't trying to raise my hand. I I was trying to use the clap function to, um, to applaud Frank and, um, and all of you uh, at the Old Guard for, um, for taking on this topic, Frank, for, um, for sharing your experiences and, uh, and everyone for, um, for engaging in the dialogue and thinking about what we can all do to, uh, to play our part. So that's it, thank you. Thank you, Julie. And by the way, Jack is attending our meetings these days. Oh, I'm so happy to hear that. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Thanks. Uh, Maggie Momber. 
one more visitor, but you have to unmute. There. there. Oh, wonderful. Can you hear me now? Yes. Wonderful. I'd like to thank you uh, for this invitation to join you here today. I, I really appreciate that. And um, you're all doing so many very, very interesting activities. So I'd like to applaud that as well. Uh, Frank, thank you for your talk. I always learn something new from you. And I feel very grateful to know you both from Christ Church and from uh, running to, into you in the halls at, at Christ Church. Um, I'm lucky enough to run an organization which is housed in Christ Church. And um, Paul has helped me tremendously. And thank you, Paul. And several of you, I think, know about our organization. Um, we wouldn't be functioning at, without what Paul is doing right now for, for all of you. Um, I thought uh, one of the most moving parts of your speech um, was actually the photos that you showed at the end, Frank, of your <laughs> fabulous, gorgeous grandchildren with those beautiful smiles. And to think that we can snuff those smiles out uh, by what is done to our youth uh, just makes me wanna cry sometimes. And what our organization does um, in brief of uh, what Paul didn't say to, is to help um, these kids have a better life and keep those smiles on their faces. Um, we can't change racism, but we can provide a better education. And if you had the time to listen to me talk about what we do, it might provide to you an opportunity to do some things that help with income inequality. Um, and uh, you know, empowering our youth, uh, black, brown, and uh, the newly arrived uh, to have a, a better life, keep the smiles on those faces. And I just wanted to say one thing about Irvington. Irvington seems to be from what I see uh, only occupied by poor. Um, and I get a number of applications from parents in Irvington who are just desperate to get their kids into a better high school than what the Irvington High School um, can offer. And those parents uh, work so hard, they have to provide a lengthy application and all kinds of financial information and it's hard work. And these parents do it and they follow up politely. Um, as I say, as a fundraiser, be politely persistent and they are politely persistent with me and sometimes, um, you know, so inspiring that I uh, bend our rules, perhaps, or go out and beg for more funding. So um, it's a town that really needs um, all the assistance that we could provide. And I know I'm not supposed to give a speech. So Frank, uh, my question is, um, and you can respond now or later or both, uh, what can we do to help uh, more with what your topic is primarily, which is racism. Uh, what we can do is to really become educated as to what racism is. A lot of people. Um, what I meant we, I meant Student Partner Alliance. Oh, well, then why don't you and I have a private conversation about it? Okay, all right. <laughs> That's why I said you don't have to respond now. Thank okay. you, and thank you for that fabulous and very inspiring presentation. Thank you, Maggie. I just wanted to mention that uh, one of the ways that old guardians could actually help directly is to volunteer as a mentor in the program that Maggie runs it's not connected with Christ Church, but it, it, she has an office there, which is why we know. And I'm going to get Maggie as a speaker one of these days, so you'll hear more about that. And I, I'd, I'd like to say one other thing because Maggie brought it up. The pictures that I showed earlier that I screen shared for Frank, his uh, two grandsons, and then the toddler at the end, Mason, that most wonderful picture. I just love it. He's their Penny and Frank's great grandson, and they are raising him. Now he's going to be embarrassed. He, uh, maybe he doesn't want me to say this, but because of family issues, they are actually raising their great grandson. And that is why Frank looks so youthful these days. He's running around the house trying to keep up with his toddler. 
Oh, I just, I just love. This is this is total love and dedication, and you know, doing what needs to be done. And I just am so in awe of Frank and Penny for what they do in the world. So enough said. Next person, uh, Haas. Before your microphone was broken, do you want to try again? You have to unmute. Maybe not yet. So, Jim Fagan. Uh, yes, um, with regard to that question of breaking the cycle and um, uh, how do you go about doing that, um, I would refer you to uh, the uh, website of St. Benedict's Prep. It's www.sbp.org. Um, this is a school in Newark, in the central ward of, ward of Newark, that the Benedictines have run for over 150 years. It has absolutely no religious requirement on the part of the students. Uh, after the Newark riots in 1970, it re, or in 1967, it reconstituted itself as a school for the disadvantaged. And um, uh, to me, it's been kind of a testimonial to the existence of God because there is no way its business model works. Practically nobody that goes there can pay, but somehow or other they keep finding the money to keep it going. Um, they've been featured on 60 Minutes, the television show for their success. When these kids come in, they're put in a group and they're given big brothers and there will be a group, I don't know, eight or 10, but there will be some seniors and there will be some uh, younger ones in the group. A very high percentage go on to college. Um, Many of them come from broken homes. So some years ago, Benedict's decided to build a dormitory and there's about 70 that live there full time. I believe the student body is now between six and 700. Uh, it was all boys until this, uh, this summer. And what happened, Benedictine Academy uh, uh, went out of business. It had been run by the Benedictine nuns for over, over 100 years. That was all girls. And what has happened now, Benedict's has started a girls wing uh, of 60 or 70 girls, largely from Benedictine Academy. Uh, but they've been very successful uh, in doing what they've, uh, what they've done. Uh, I know they're doing a lot with online learning now because of the virus. Uh, I don't know how it would be resolved, but if a group of the old guard wanted to go down and physically examine the building, I, I'm confident I could arrange that. I don't know how it could be done in the context of, of the virus, but I think if you look at the, um, if you look at the website, I think it would be instructive. And I think this is an example of a model, well, how do you break the cycle? And I think this is an example in that regard. I'm not sure. I thought Frank's talk was excellent. Uh, excellent. I'm not sure if Frank is uh, familiar with St. Benedict's, but I just thought I would mention that in light of the discussions about breaking the cycle. I, I am familiar with our uh, St. Benedict's and Father Ed. Um, they do a fantastic job. And uh, their model is one that is trying to be uh, replicated in uh, other places uh, around the country. It's a great program. Okay, um, we're going to try one more time with Haas Sri Sri Kantan, who uh, was having mic problems before. So, go ahead, Haas. You're on. You're unmuted, Haas. We can't hear you, Haas. No, Haas. I'm sorry, but your mic is not working. If we've had this problem before with Haas, so. Sorry, Haas. So next is um, Vic Garber. You must unmute. Thanks again, Frank. Very enlightening presentation. Everything here is very complicated. It's not like one issue uh, controls the other. One of the major things that I know is education and how do you get ahead in the world? And how do you get a good job? And how do you get your family into a system? I'm, uh, 
I, well, I don't want to get into my family too much, but I've been lucky to, we have nine grandchildren, seeing all of them go to college. And from there, they have a springboard and maybe, you know, live the American dream. I don't know if the opportunities for the American dream are what they used to be. Uh, with the COVID, you're going to have hold on a lot of education and a lot of opportunity. And with what we have in uh, our political system now, things are, I think, stacked even more negatively uh, with what's coming out of the education department. I wonder if you could give me a prognosis about how long you think it might take before we get some sort of level playing field uh, as racism has been pushed down the road, you know, for several hundreds of years. And how do you, how, how do you see a plateau reached uh, in the future? Victor, you're talking to a person who back in uh, English class back in 1962 said, yeah, uh, by uh, uh, 1980, we will uh, achieve equality. How dumb that was, how naive that was. And uh, uh, although I'm an optimist, uh, <laughs> I still think that I underestimate things in this area. My wife said to me, back when I started working on dismantling the new Jim Crow thing, she said, you're going to be working on this until the day you die. She said, this, the change that you seek is very difficult and you won't see uh, the fruits of your work during your lifetime. But if you think this is important, you should work on it because of our children and our grandchildren. And she was right. Victor, I can't tell you uh, how long it's going to take. It is difficult work. Uh, but it must be done. It is being done. We are making progress. But every time you make a step forward, you seem to get smacked back two steps. And all we can do is continue to march. The young people today don't seem to have the patience for the incremental uh, gains that uh, you know we've, we've been used to. They want to make big changes, and I applaud that and support that. If they are successful, then the time frame shrinks. If not, then who knows? In Congress, we still have the filibuster. We still have a system that makes no sense. Uh, Miguel told you that the Voting Rack Act has been sitting on the desk of uh, 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 our legislators forever. So a lot of things go into coming up with the answer to your question. Uh, an optimist like myself uh, I say I hope to see more rapid change, but the pragmatic uh, advice that I get from my wife is probably more accurate. It's probably going to take a long time to change uh, all the things that need to be changed for the uh, uh, playing field to become level. It may never get there, but the struggle to continue to try to make the right changes must continue. Thanks, Nick. The question. Thanks. Ron Hoke. Thanks again, Frank. Another great talk. What can we, as members of the old guard, or a bunch of old white guys, do to bring in more African Americans into the old guard? Um, that's the question that Bill asked earlier. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm thinking about bringing in people into the old guard, not another group to work with the old guard. Yeah, I, 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 okay, I see the difference. Uh, I think what you have to do is you have to have members of the old guard reach out to uh, people they know uh, and, and, and invite them in. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a membership by invitation. Uh, and that's, that's the way it's going to have to work. Thank you. Um, Leslie, this might be Leslie Carson, I'm not sure. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Is that Leslie Carson? It is Leslie Carson, and I'm sorry. I've got a new computer, and I haven't figured out how to put on my video. That's okay. Uh, but I want to thank you for inviting guests, and I want to thank you, Frank, too. I have a suggestion about how the old guard can help. 
Uh, New Providence has been a real holdout in regards to addressing racism. But there is one man who lives here, Alan Swanson. He's been a voice crying in the wilderness, and he created a proclamation about working towards overcoming racism in New Providence for the borough council. They have ignored it, but the Old Guard is a large and powerful organization, and perhaps if you got behind the proclamation, it would make a real difference in this town. Uh, may I send that information to you, Paul, and to Frank, and to anyone else, and see if you would like to work on this? Yes, please do, Leslie. I, I, I'll communicate that to our members, including Frank. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Leslie. Vic Rosenberg, let me do an unmute request. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Some of, some of what I'm going to say is a bit of an amplification for what's been said, but there is a question here as well. The amplification is that um, there are a lot of white men in this country who are very afraid of becoming a minority, which is a part of the anger and pushback that we get from our fellow white folks. That said, and by the way, there's something else for Bill Tittle. Bill, uh, in, is, is it possible to reach out to the Fountain Baptist Church in Summit, which is a very vibrant and active black church, uh, to arrange to become a speaker, to make a presentation about the old guard, to see if there might be interest from people in that congregation to join and participate in our group. I'm just throwing that out there. The next thing, and I think this is something that you said, Frank, at the beginning of your presentation to the old guard, to this group of old privileged white men. We have an opportunity here to become active anti-racists as part of our changing the ideas about racism in our sphere of influence. And what I mean by that is, there, we come across people often, or sometimes, or whenever, who make racist jokes, who say things that are racist, either directly or indirectly, and often we suffer silently when we hear those kinds of intrusions into that issue. And my suggestion is, don't be silent. Raise your voice. Speak out against those kinds of slurs when you hear them. And when you come across people who are spouting bad lies and incorrect things about the Black Lives Movement, don't suffer silently. Speak out with the facts that are absolutely in front of us all as to why their attitudes and their comments are false, incorrect, and need to be challenged. So that's my long-winded kind of question and comment to you, Frank. Yeah. I, I think I categorize that as an amplification uh, a well done application and thank you very much. I, I think that's a good message and uh, it could be delivered from a better source. Thank you. Hey Frank, this is Mitch Erickson. I wanted to amplify on that and what I was going to say is we need to talk uh, about this topic with our kids, our grandkids, our great grandkids because that is our sphere of influence and I grew up in a family uh, where that kind of conversation went on and uh, uh, a little younger than you, Frank, but you know, it's very important for all of us to speak to our children, grandchildren, great grandchildren, um, and not as, as, as Vic just said, uh, say anything that's even slightly uh, off color about uh, um, minorities and races. Although I will ha happily admit that I am a Swedish person and I will tell Sven and Oli jokes with the best of them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Okay, well, um, we've reached a point where there are no more blue hands. <laughs> and uh, last chance, everybody, if you can't raise a blue hand and you really want to say something, you could do this quickly. If Raise your hand in front of your um, camera. I'm not seeing anybody, so I think we've reached the end. And I'm going to hand the, uh, the mic back to Don. Oops, we got two blue hands. Uh, okay, Fred Fisher. Wait a second. Ask to unmute. Fred. His wife hey. is there too. It could be either it's, of them. It's Judy. Actually, I'm the one who wants to say Judy. something. Judy. Judy Fisher. Um, two things. One, um, when you ask what can the old guard do, um, I'm not sure how it's working now during the pandemic, but when we are able to get together again, it would be wonderful if you had a dialogue session with old guard members. Um, these dialogue sessions are terrific. Um, the summit, interfaith councils, um, dialogue circles on race. Um, so if, if, if you get one of these going, or, or more than one of these going among the, the old guard members. I think that would be terrific. Um, another thing I want to bring up is um, sometimes I think this is not a contribution at all, but other times I like to believe it is. Um, since my retirement, I'm big into genealogy and I have found now because I'm more interested in spreading out to connect to as many people as possible rather than going back and uh, finding famous ancestors. Um, I have found that there are more people of color and mixed race in my, in my family tree. And for a number of reasons, um, not all, um, wonderful reasons. Sometimes it was rape back among us in the slave days. Um, but no matter what the reason, I see now there are so many people of color in my family tree that I can see that not only are we not different races, but we're not even in a different family. There is really no such thing as race. We're all one race, the human race. And now I see because of my genealogical research that we are not only one race, we are one family. Well said. Thank you, Judy. Um, Alan Hamilton. So Frank, I'm gonna ask the shortest question yet. What do you think of the <laughs> old white guys uh, in terms of uh, race relations? What are you gonna tell your friends about us? Oh, us? Yeah. Oh yeah, we go back and talk to that friend. Uh, I'm gonna tell my friends that the old guard is up for the challenge. <laughs> All right, now we recorded this session so you can give them the code to get it. Okay, will do. It's going to be a greatest hit on YouTube. <laughs> Thank you, Alan. So, no more blue hands? Okay. Jim, Done. Uh, oh, sorry. Jim Blinn. Oh, Jim Blinn. Oh, yeah, another hand just arrived. Go ahead, Jim. You were unmuted and then you got muted, Jim. Go Oops, again. Okay. There you go. I, I unmuted again. Okay. Yes. So I really enjoyed your talk, Frank. And I'm just wondering, as you said, you've been in Berkeley Heights all these years. And I'm just wondering if you've seen what kind of changes you've seen in racism in this area over those years. Jim has also been in Berkeley Heights all those years. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've, I've seen change. Uh, when we first moved in, there were very few, uh, very little diversity. As a matter of fact, some of my uh, people, friends from outside the, the town used to refer to the town as Berkeley Whites. <laughs> but uh, there's been more and more diversity over the, over the years. And uh, uh, I think there's been some progress. We have had difficulties here in town when we first moved into town. Uh, the first thing 
that our attorney had to do at the closing was to remove the clause from the deed which said that the house we were buying would be sold to Negroes. Oh my gosh. The next thing we encountered was a neighbor next door who built a fence around his property separated from ours because he was afraid that his daughter might go up and marry a black man. Uh, so you ask about uh, race uh, in, in, in Berkeley Heights. Uh, it uh, has been, uh, uh, there have been improvements, uh, but there's still work to do. And I can say that uh, uh, it seems that the, the, the leadership of the town is up to doing that work. Uh, and I think that uh, the, the, the tide is right for making even greater progress here uh, than we have in the past. Good. Thank you. Thank you. No more blue hands. Okay, Don, take it away. All right. Thank I'm you very to, much, Frank. Uh, Don, I'm ready to do a screen share if you want. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Frank, for uh, an excellent presentation. Uh, obviously, extremely timely. Uh, I, for one, am looking forward to uh, forwarding the uh, video recording uh, of your presentation to uh, some of my family members who live uh, out of state and uh, at least one of whom I know will be very uh, interested uh, in, uh, in further disseminating it. So uh, again, thank you very much and I look forward to uh, meeting you in person. Uh, I'm a relatively new member so uh, we've not met up until now, it's to see. but I'm honored to have had the chance to uh, introduce you as part of uh, my monthly program. I, I just unmuted everybody so we can do the old guard salute. But first, let's do the certificate. Done. I'm sorry, I don't understand, Paul. Yeah, um, let me uh, do this. Um, Somebody else. Uh, we, um, Frank, we're very grateful for your talk, and we have a tradition of uh, of giving certificates of appreciation to our uh, speakers. And Paul, if you can put it up there, we can all see uh, example. Yeah, you already have one, Frank, so you can paper the your wall with it. <laughs> and I won't even uh, give you the uh, orchid. Uh, but uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is just a terrific talk. Yeah, right. What were they guarding against? Yeah. Is that emblem? So, so now let's have an old guard salute. Okay, so, okay I so I think it's time to um, transition um, uh, to uh, the math group and it'll, uh, let's uh, give uh, five uh, or so minutes and rejoin for the math interest group. Okay, um, I've, just re I've just muted everybody, uh, but you can unmute if you want to talk. And in particular, Walt might want to say something at this point. But, yeah, uh, um, yeah, we'll allow five minutes for people to get a sandwich or something. This will be like a lunch and learn type of session here. <laughs> okay. Frank, we're going to hear about the Google search algorithm and the mathematics behind it. So you're welcome to stay too. <laughs> Thanks a lot, everybody. Okay. Thanks, Frank. Yeah.